Can you hear me? All right, very good. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Judiciary Non-Civil, bright and early on this Thursday. Uh, we'll go ahead and begin the meeting at this time, and I'll ask uh, Vice Chairman Gravely if he'll lead us in our uh, invocation this morning. Yes, sir. You just hit your microphone. Yeah, thanks. Good morning. All right. Lord, we thank you for this morning and be able to uh, gather together and discuss the issues facing our state. Lord, we just thank you for everyone in attendance this morning. And Lord, we would ask that you would bless every family that's represented in this room today. Give us uh, wisdom and direction, Lord, as we try to do what's right for Georgia. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Very good. So um, what I'll do is we're going to hand out the uh, folders now and we'll give an initial um, just kind of a, give an initial run through of the agenda for today so first of all we have um, we have three bills on the agenda today house bill 720 we have a substitute that is coming on that and um, we'll work to get copies out within the room but it should reflect the modifications that were made in subcommittee on Tuesday evening when we had the five-hour subcommittee then at 8 p.m. so uh, so everybody can take a look at that there are two handwritten uh, changes that I've made on that so you can uh, confirm that that is consistent with uh, what was um, what was done in committee we have House Bill 1040 and House Bill 1083 so it looks like um, we have representative Donahue here for House Bill 1040. So we'll go ahead and proceed with that bill at this time if you'd like to come forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee. Um, is there a sign up sheet, sir? No, sir. We don't have one out. I know testimony was heard on this in subcommittee. Is that, uh, is that, a, I just were you seeking that. additional testimony? Well, I had just more people that came if needed that. That work in that Maybe let's see what questions we have and okay. see whether or not that's necessary. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> tell, tell you what, if you are interested in potential witness testimony, we got a couple bills on the calendar in a short period of time. If you would just hold tight, we'll go ahead and move to House Bill 1083. I see our two sponsors over here to the left and go and get get that headed first. Thank you, Thank Representative you, Donahue. Thank you, Henry. All right, so we'll recognize Chairman Petrie, Representative Singleton at this time. Both the microphones are on, just at your pleasure. You, uh, go ahead and present House Bill 1083 to us. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, members of this committee, thank you very much. We had, uh, I want to begin by thanking everyone for the uh, for the opportunity yesterday to have a great deal of testimony and presentation, I appreciate it. It was very good. We heard from both sides, and uh, it was particularly uh, helpful, I think, to have Director Giles there to answer any questions. Um, this is substitute to House Bill 1083 uh, that we discussed uh, at length yesterday. And uh, this bill is, uh, as I said yesterday, um, I think everyone. Uh, here was there yesterday so if I repeat myself forgive me uh, this bill is clearly about public safety um, uh, there is a human cost to sanctuary policies and as we heard director uh, Giles say yesterday and what we have today in Georgia is uh, a sanctuary law on the books uh, that is uh, that has a definition of sanctuary policies that is uh, inadequate, that is uh, very weak, uh, established in, in 2009, and um, we have, um, uh, although we discussed yesterday the, the hammer that exists in that statute today, I think the fact that we have so many jurisdictions that were spoken to yesterday by Representative Singleton that are uh, disregarding that law altogether in Georgia, and, and again, this is state law in Georgia today, obviously uh, we have a very weak statute for sanctuary policies. And uh, uh, when you discover that entire counties are sanctuary counties in the state of Georgia, most people don't understand that, but that is the fact. And so if there indeed was a hammer there, um, um, it, it's not working. And so um, 
So what we do here is begin by defining really what a sanctuary policy is in a much better way. The current statute only speaks to communicating. And you'll see that in this bill in the marked out language with the current definition. It only speaks to that. The new definition provided for here is thorough. And it speaks to uh, much uh, more than just communicating. It speaks to the whole issue of uh, uh, honoring ICE detainers. And, and again, as I pointed out yesterday, I don't want to get it, go through it line by line as I did yesterday, but all the different, the five different pieces here of what would be a trigger to this legislation. At the end of the day, what this does is say that if you violate state law, uh, if you violate current state law, which we now are going to amend, and you uh, disregard uh, that law, that we're going to provide a cause of action for individuals that are harmed by individuals who are released because of that sanctuary policy. And I can't imagine anything that's more fair to victims and anything that is more, if, if indeed a community believes that it is, not, that it is somehow uh, uh, just and right to disregard um, these ICE detainers, and, and they don't believe there's a human cost to that in terms of public safety, then they can violate the rule of law. When, and, but, if, but if individuals are harmed by, the, by that policy, they would have a means of recourse that they do not have today. So that is very simply what this bill does. We answered a lot of questions yesterday and I'm glad to answer more today. All right, thank you. Uh, Representative Singleton, anything you want to add? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks uh, to you and the committee for uh, hearing us again this morning. Uh, we heard yesterday, uh, I believe it was very apparent to everyone in the committee uh, that there, there is a, a hyper-partisan and political aspect um, that was brought forth, and I think that you saw a very big distinction in the, in the two types of testimonies yesterday. There was a very political side. Uh, that wanted to avoid this issue because uh, there are a lot of people out of there that are trying to make these issues, these common sense pieces of legislation, they're trying to gain political points and, and consolidate votes. And then you saw another side of the testimony uh, that was very nonpartisan and it was about protecting uh, the individual citizens here in Georgia. And I just encourage the, the committee uh, to continue to show that Georgia is a leader in our country. Uh, we are uh, you know, bold in doing what's right and protecting life and protecting our citizens. Uh, we did that last year with the heartbeat bill. Uh, I believe the nature of this bill, the fact that it is bipartisan support and our primary sponsors, uh, it just is a testament to those that want common sense legislation that protects us. Uh, that's important in Georgia, and, and I think it's important we pass this bill and we continue to share the message that uh, we're willing to take the hard discussions up and we're willing to do the difficult things if they protect Georgia's and I just appreciate your consideration. All right, thank you to the sponsors. We have a few questions. So uh, first, number 14, is that Representative McLaurin? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, again, would like to stay laser focused if possible on the mechanics of this bill. Would you agree that the new cause of action makes a local government liable for all torts that are committed by an undocumented person within their jurisdiction? No, no, I disagree with that. Okay. So the way I read this, and I just I would like help understanding, it says that an individual injured by tortious acts or omissions, and it doesn't say it's just wrongful death, it's all torts, of a person unlawfully present, right, shall have a cause of action against the local governing entity upon proof of the following. Two things. One, the existence of a sanctuary policy. Two, sanctuary policy resulting in such person having access to the individual injured or killed. So here's my question. If you have a store owner who is an undocumented person, that otherwise you allege in your complaint, which you don't have to prove it at the point of the complaint, you get discovery if you can just allege this, that a local government sanctuary policy caused that restaurant owner to still be in the community and still be in business. And that restaurant owner doesn't salt the ice, the icy sidewalk in front of their restaurant. Somebody slips and falls on this. You don't agree that the local government becomes liable vicariously for that tort? I do not. And why not? I do not. Why don't you believe that, Mr. I Chairman? don't believe that is accurate. This is clearly about this individual must be injured by the, the, the tortious acts or omissions of a person unlawfully present in the United States. So you would have to have an individual who had, uh, uh, who had been, uh, rightly should have been forwarded to ICE, and a jurisdiction that refused to do so, and then subsequently 
caused with a preponderance of the evidence an injury or death of an individual in the community. So, Mr. Chairman, I have one follow-up question. I believe you've got an, uh, a grossly exaggerated example there. Yeah, one more question. Okay, Sorry. thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I guess my question is, if a local government is making a custody decision about whether to transfer a person into ICE custody pursuant to a detainer that they can't establish the legal basis for themselves, and the alternative is to let them out into a community not knowing if they might commit a tort, when otherwise, again, but for that decision, they would have been in ICE custody, meaning that the local government is on the hook for that decision to put them out in the community. Why would they not be liable for every tort committed as a result of that local government decision to let them back into the community? So, so just, just to specifically, to yeah, just to specifically, because um, I, I think I understand the question. Uh, and the scenario you gave, uh, the time that that would be true is if that store, store owner that you're referencing uh, had been arrested and convicted or, or convicted of a crime and then was subsequently released. His, his mere existence uh, in, in uh, society is, does not meet the definition of sanctuary policy. So it has to be in violation of sanctuary policy that's in, in the first paragraph of the bill in order to meet that definition uh, that we talked about. So just as mere existence here uh, as, a, as a criminal alien, or excuse me, as an undocumented uh, person doesn't meet the sanctuary policy. And, and again, like we mentioned yesterday, uh, the decision is still up to, to the municipality. So uh, it, is, uh, it is our position uh, that uh, if that, muni that municipality still has the subjective decision-making authority under this bill, uh, if they want to continue to violate Georgia law and federal law, they have the ability to do that, but there will be the option for the Georgian can then sue them and, and have some sort of day in court uh, in front of a jury when their rights are violated. And we believe that's important. And if the municipality decides to make that decision, uh, then they can answer to their, uh, their constituents. Representative Saints. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to uh, Representative Petri uh, Petrie and uh, Representative Singleton, Singleton, thank you for bringing this public safety measure behind, uh, in the committee. I, um, I frankly uh, appreciate that in my district I have no local government who doesn't adhere to the rule of law and adhere to the requirement that our federal government has in, in, in constitutional authority to enforce our immigration laws. But when looking at this and talking with the authors of this bill, um, is it fair to say that if a individual who um, – went through a agency who has a cultural or cult, a formal or informal policy to not adhere to the to uh, US uh, code chapter 8 1373 um, if that individual left that area of the state and went to my district and, and committed a, a, a violent felony a citizen in my district would be could be put in harm's way because of the actions of, of lack of adherence to federal to, to law um, in another uh, municipality. Is that's that correct. fair to say? Yes, sir. That's correct. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's happening today. Representative Kendrick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is um, two questions. I hope you will indulge me. So on line 40, we talk about the proof uh, by preponderance of the evidence. And since we're waiving sovereign immunity, uh, which and it seems like we're um, giving unlimited liability to the cities. Why? What, what was the choice in making it a preponderance of the evidence as opposed to clear and convincing, given the fact that we're waiving sovereign immunity? So that's the standard burden of proof in a civil proceeding. Okay. I understand it's the standard, but since we are waiving sovereign immunity, yes. why you can change it is my, is my point. Why, again, just in an attempt to answer the member's question, please tell me if this doesn't, but in a standard civil proceeding, it's a preponderance of the evidence standard. So in other words, in criminal law, which is what we mm -hmm. typically focus on in this committee, it's a beyond a reasonable doubt standard that the proponent or prosecutor must prove. Um, in a civil proceeding, it's a 51 percent which side prevails by preponderance of the right, evidence. Right, and I understand that because I, yes, I do practice law too, but the the – it, when you have civil cases, one of the standards can be clear and convincing, correct? I'll, uh, I'll, we can put that to the sponsors or maybe if, uh, if another, if Chairman Fleming looks like he wants to respond. I think you, I think you could change it to clear and convincing. I think you could change it to clear and convincing if you wanted to make it harder on these families who had a member of their family killed, raped, or harmed some way. If you want to make it harder on them to recover, yeah, you could make that change. Or we can make it 
harder to bankrupt our city. So I guess it depends on the way that you look at it. So, okay, uh, that's fine. Um, my second question is, is <coughs> line 47. So it, it seems to give unlimited liability to the cities because it says to the extent of liability created by this code section, what was the policy decision to not make it the cap on the insurance that the cities have? Um, let me take both of your questions again, uh, and I appreciate uh, Chairman and Chairman for answering that. Uh, well, I, we, we were both looking around to look for Jeff Lanier, Legislative Council that drafted this. And he is, uh, Mr. Yeah. Lanier is in another committee yeah, and, is cu and will be here shortly. But I wanted to answer the first question by saying sure. that was his, the, the preponderance of evidence was what he recommended, and I think uh, Chairman Estration answered it well as to the why. We looked to him for guidance, and that was going to be my answer. And this is what he recommended due to the type of uh, uh, law we were dealing with. To the second question, you know, I, I have to tell you, you know, this is all real easy. If you have a uh, jurisdiction that simply complies with current state and federal law, there's no liability here. And that's what we want. We don't want there to be any liability. So, um, you know, I don't know how to answer you on that. I, I'm not concerned about, um, I'm more concerned about, I'm more concerned about, this is just in, the, in, in, in our state prisons. I'm more concerned about, I'm more concerned about the 1,600 individuals who've been violently, uh, been, been, been raped, kidnapped, murdered, armed assault, armed robbery, aggravated child molestation. I'm far more concerned with that than I am with the liability on a city who flagrantly disregards federal and state law. So I don't know how she want me to answer that, and, Representative. And, and I could add, if I may, I mean, uh, the uh, we went through a painstaking process in, in drafting this legislation. And I will tell you that as you've drafted much legislation yourself, you, you know, you do have to start with some assumptions. We started with, I think, two major assumptions, and I think uh, the chairman would agree with me, but uh, one, we started with the assumption that uh, Georgia cities and municipalities want to follow federal and state law. So we started with the assumption that their desire is to follow the law. Uh, and the second assumption that we made is that if there was a default between protecting the government or protecting an individual Georgian, we always wanted to default with the citizens of Georgia. All right. So, uh, Whip Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to Chairman Petrie, to Representative Singleton, uh, just to be clear, uh, isn't it true that in no other point of Georgia law, including the Civil Practice Act, do we limit recovery for an individual who's been injured to insurance uh, limits? Isn't that true? That's, true. That's my understanding. Standing, Mr. Whip, from and, and uh, legislative fact, council under the Civil Practice Act, isn't it expressly prohibited when you're discussing to a jury uh, to introduce any form of uh, discussion in terms of insurance policy limits? Yes, that's my understanding from legislative council. Thank Mr. Whip, Mr. Gravely. Thank you to the author. I just want to be clear, <clears throat> uh, and for the record, just maybe to answer my colleague's concerns, if the city is upholding the rule of law is 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 in adherence to the law then there is no exposure for liability uh, and absolutely the waiver of sovereign immunity and governmental immunity has not been waived not in so any that, way that, shape that or is form. a completely intact if they are within the bounds of the law correct the local jurisdiction representative would have to go out of their way to flagrantly disregard current federal and so state. So a follow-up, Mr. Chairman. That's correct. So it, it, within that, within those parameters, there w it, there would be then therefore no concern nor worry of the city, the municipality, going bankrupt due to a civil suit that has been brought because there would be no civil suit eligible to be brought. That's correct. Correct? Correct. So Thank you. Representative Setzler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to the authors of the bill. I appreciate your, your, your thoughtful approach with this. I know the bill started in a, in, a, in a different form and through the process of deliberation, kind of working through this. Um, isn't it true you're looking to take sort of a lighter touch to this approach 
uh, Absolutely. You, just the way you do this? That's why we changed the current versions. Uh, the, the initial versions of my bill and Senator Singl uh, Representative Singleton's bill were, um, uh, were dramatically different. Right. We wanted a simpler, fairer approach that was targeted to public safety. Yeah. Isn't it true also that um, when the General Assembly created our cities and counties by, by state law, uh, one thing they're subject to is to follow our state laws. Um, and the, uh, and the, the things in question here with respect to police powers, whereas there are certain limited powers in our state constitution uh, that local governments have the province to address, the, uh, the, the issue of the police power and following state law with respect to um, enforcing the, the paramount duty of government, which in our Constitution is the protection of life and property. There's no discretion to sort of browse through our laws and decide what they're going to enforce and what they're not going to enforce. Isn't that how our, our, our system works in the state? Yes, sir. That's um, my understanding. So if I'm following your thinking is uh, there is a specific state law that requires and gives every city a duty to do certain things, and it's only by their specifically acting with a specific act uh, of city government to not do those things which they have a legal lawful duty to perform that they could have any exposure. Yes, sir. Isn't it true we're not, we're not putting elected officials in jail? There's, there's no criminal response. This is simply a circumstance. None of that is in here. <laughs> which if, Mr. Chairman, if, if a city has a lawful obligation under state law to perform something that they don't do, and then one of their citizens suffers uh, harm or, or death, at the hands of something they had a duty to perform, then and only then is there any criminal exposure whatsoever. Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Chairman, I know we've debated this some, and um, I don't know what the posture of the chair is. Uh, the proper time, you, I'd like to be recognized. A few more questions, okay. Mr. Trammell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to make sure I understand something about your bill. Um, if a victim is undocumented, Just want to make sure that that victim has access uh, under your bill to the remedy that's provided. It might take a, more, a better legal mind to answer that, but I'll tell you what I would hope to be the case. Any individual, you know, we had a powerful statement by a couple of ladies yesterday, and, and a lovely lady from Cambodia spoke from Gwinnett County, and she said something very powerful I hope everybody here heard yesterday. She said that so much of the time, these violent crimes committed by illegal aliens are committed on her community, in immigrant communities. And so I'll tell you what, absolutely. I would hope that we would capture everybody who is, who is damaged by this reckless policy. If I, that if would I, be my hope, sir. If I may add, you know, there was significant, uh, thank you uh, for the for the question, I think it's a really great question. Uh, there are several conversations with the Department of Homeland Security, the director, uh, and subsidiaries of ICE, uh, local sheriff's association, really law enforcement across the state, uh, and what we have found to be true and what the intent of this bill is, uh, although I do believe there are protections in the, in the Georgia Code uh, for that scenario that you're talking about, which uh, one of these really sharp lawyers could probably point you directly to that section, but uh, we do understand they have that protection, but uh, you actually talk about the, the exact people we are trying to protect because the, the statistics in all law enforcement tell us that the primary victims of these criminals, uh, when they are released from custody in violation of federal and state law, they don't go back into, uh, you know, most of our communities. It's often those communities of those people that we are trying to help protect. And so it's important that we understand uh, who we're trying to protect here, and it is, it is the immigrant communities in particular. Mr. More. Um, I want to talk about the notion of proximate cause under the law, and I just want to try to understand, um, is it your intention if someone was, um, let's say, a, a traffic stop and they had an ICE detainer um, and, and they were released, um, and subsequently, five years or more down the road, they committed a tort? Um, should that victim, the victim of the tort, have redress under what you're proposing here? 
So I'll, I'll answer that one if that's all right. Okay. Unless you have you go first. So um, the the short answer is yes. So uh, what you're talking about now, if they are released because of ICE uh, inability to uh, get there within the current confines of the law, that's right. then there would be no recourse because there's no violation, there's no willful violation of fate, state and federal law. So it would have to be that you prove for the, for the uh, in this case, you would have to prove willful violation of federal and state law, which led to the release uh, of that criminal alien. And then subsequently, it doesn't, the, the time between crime is, ir is irrelevant. The time between crime doesn't matter. What matters is protecting the citizens of Georgia. If, if I could add to that, too, to Leader Trammell's question. So the first thing I would say is, again, uh, none of this would apply unless there was a sanctuary policy in that local jurisdiction. So it wouldn't be a law enforcement officer releasing someone. It, it, this is about a policy would have to exist that said, like was read yesterday, uh, that said, we don't work with ICE. That's our policy. But moreover, I want to say this to the, to the question. Remember, I, you know, I made a note yesterday from Director Giles, a direct quote he said, 90% of ICE arrests are convicted criminals. 90%. I mean, so this, this red heron about, you know, speeders is, is uh, you know, it is what it is. But Mr. Kelly. at any rate. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want us to just be very clear about what this bill does and what this doesn't because there, there appears to be some confusion. What this bill does do is it creates a new right of action for inter, in, injured individuals or their family uh, if that person has been killed. Uh, that, res that, 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 that action will be the result of a city first creating a sanctuary policy where they have chosen to disregard state law and federal law. Second, the results of their um, flagrant disregard for state and federal law has then allowed an individual to walk free who's unlawfully in our country, and then that individual has caused harm to another. That's what this bill does. It creates that right of action. What this bill doesn't do is change any other provisions of the Civil Practice Act. And the Civil Practice Act, one, makes no distinction between individuals who are in our country legally or illegally. A undocumented or unlawful individual in our state today has protections under the Civil Practice Act. This law does not change that. Second, this bill will make no changes to how proximate cause uh, is weighed by judges and juries across the state. This bill has no variance from the Civil Practice Act in that space. It's on us to be very clear and us not try to get, you know, confusion stirred up. Um, in terms of what this bill does or doesn't do. And uh, with that being said, Mr. Chairman, uh, if, if now is the proper time, I'd like to make a motion. Now is the proper time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would move that uh, this committee adopt the substitute to House Bill 1083, LC number 289709S. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. Any amendments? Mr. Trammell. All right, I see no amendments. We'll have discussion at this point in time, Mr. Trammell. Well, Mr. Chairman, I respectfully uh, to my colleague uh, disagree about what the bill says. Um, it actually doesn't require a government entity to adopt a formal policy. It just, per it just says that if there's anything, a law, policy, practice, procedure, or custom, formal or informal, written or unwritten, adopted or allowed, I mean, you can't possibly get anything more broad than that. So we're creating a strict liability tort. And let's not be confused about that. All right. Um, Representative McLaurin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think my one comment just, my, my other comments stand for themselves, but um, we've heard a lot of what I would call misinformation about willful violation of, quote, federal and state law. Federal law cannot compel state or local authorities to comply with ICE requests. This bill makes it subject to liability for a local government to refuse to comply with a voluntary request. And the only state law that would compel that is the state law we're creating in this bill, which says, because let's not make a mistake, the current state of the law is 
immigration status information is the only thing that a local government is required to supply, i.e., that's the, the scope of sanctuary policy is not providing that specific information about immigration status. This bill expands it to include data release, cooperation with detainers, availability for interviews. <laughs> so it provides substantive obligations to local governments that do not currently exist under the law to transfer custody of an individual. And that is the source of the fourth potential Fourth Amendment liability. And, and I think that we need to get away from saying that it's a willful violation of federal and state law uh, to, to have a sanctuary policy under the current state law. All right, uh, Representative Kendrick. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm Barry. Um, uh, Representative uh, Buddy. My chief's uh, microphone. I, I do want to reiterate what I stated in the subcommittee that this bill will have the possibility to uh, have a, an effect where local jurisdiction, law enforcement jurisdiction, would have to comply uh, with uh, these immigration detainers uh, and spend resources uh, to. Uh, comply uh, and they may not be reimbursed so I just want to know that this can strain local law enforcement jurisdictions that we could be using uh, those resources other places and this is and this could be an issue for law enforcement. Mr. Kelly. Thank you Mr. Chairman. There has been some discussions about the, the statute of limitations and I think we do need to need to uh, examine that uh, for, for a little bit. So, so right now I, I think it could be prudent for me maybe to just withdraw my, my motion and let's take a, take a moment to, to uh, examine that and just uh, hold off till further action. There's till, a motion till we get to, clarify on that. There's a motion to table. Is there objection? Hearing none, House Bill 1083 is tabled at this time and I want to thank the sponsors for their coming in their presentation here today. All right, we have, a, uh, we have a stacked agenda this morning. If it's all right, we will uh, get on to call back up Representative Donahue to proceed with House Bill 1040. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mind if, I hand out just if you wouldn't mind, just have a seat at the microphone, and uh, you can slide anything over here that you want to Thank hand you, out. It's okay, Clay Cox, come and just sit with me. That's fine, sure. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you again for your time and members of the committee. We bring before you basically uh, a bill that we, we discussed a little bit in our subcommittee that pretty much 1040, all it does is it changes one word, three months to six months on an ordinary probation calendar. With that, what I've handed out to you is what we discussed is to show a little bit of what the proper scheduling of pay is. You'll see the first part as pay only probation supervision fees. As you look through my county, you'll see in the municipal court of Doraville, for instance, here's a document where a judge will impose a certain fine. And then as you continuously go down, we'll see that these people that can't afford to pay, actually what happens is some of them will pay in the first month, and it doesn't require three months. Some will pay in the second, some in the third. Some pay in the 10th month or the 24th month. But the supervision's only covered for three months. So the average that you will see here on uh, probably page five shows regular active cases, pay only active cases, and pay only active cases beyond three months. And you'll see where the totals are coming up. That averages 5.5 months roughly on supervision for these cases, but the maximum they can charge us for three months. Um, that's why we're basically here before you is to just to ask the consideration for, as I said uh, a couple of days ago, we all work and do charity cases. We give our time to help people in need, but then we're also in business to make a little bit of money to make a living. 
And I know as attorneys here, you guys do a lot of cases. And in these cases, you have to pick some that you do not make money on. And there are some that you make a little money, and then there's some that you are going to make a good salary. However, all we're trying to do is bring into the proper respect of saying that each caseworker here has the opportunity to at least cover a little bit more time on the schedule for money received. Chairman Setzler, your subcommittee heard this bill. Would you give us a subcommittee report? Hey, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, yeah, it's um, it, it was reported favorably. And the, th and the thinking being that there, there's a lot of debate about how much private probation should be paid. There is some discussion parenthetically about private probation system in general. But, Mr. Chairman, what, what it really came down to for a subcommittee was if services are being rendered for a contract of the state um, for some period of months beyond um, if, if, if these cases are being managed for three to six months, some, some cases even longer, why would we impose an artificial limitation at three months um, that, uh, that this is the maximum that would be set, the average is around five and a half, it seems to be appropriate, that if we're going to ask a, a, a contractor of the state to perform a service, that there should be appropriate compensation that, that, that mirrors that. And it, it was reported favorably. All right. Any questions for the sponsor? Representative McLaurin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Thank you for the discussion this morning. Uh, this might actually be a better s suited question for former Representative Cox, but um, can you let us know what the average expenditure is by a private probation company that would be covered by this uh, for each month? Well, this is 51 public government, and there's 22 private firms in here. So we have to understand that this is not just private. This is everybody in there. Roughly, from what I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you're looking at $35 average a month for those three. There's a charge of $9 that on your list you'll see that goes to a fund, the CVEF fund. Um, so roughly around $43. That's a fee, and then, of course, the fine that the judge imposes. I'm, I'm sorry. I, what I meant to ask is the expenditure by the company as the cost per the cost person of supervision. Yes. supervision, the light bills, everything for it. Yes, I'll that look. was my question. Yes, sir. Sorry about that. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would call your attention to, on in the pamphlet, there's a sample actual sentence form of probation that's used by one of the providers. I think it's the uh, Dorval Municipal Court. This gives you a good idea. Condition one, and again, we talked about in subcommittee, the statutory conditions, and then the special conditions, you have to check those to make them active. If you check, a, if a judge checks a box, it is no longer a pay-only case for special conditions. But at top, you can see that they're ordered to pay a probation supervision fee, and then the victim's fund of $9 surcharge that goes directly to victims of Georgia. And then below that, there's a number of conditions of probation. Make sure people report, don't use illegal drugs, don't commit new offenses, and all that has to be documented under the DCS rules every time. So the sentence itself requires, drives the cost you're speaking of. So in other words, regardless if, they, if a judge checks the box for basic probation at 35 or pay only in this case at 35 after two months of no fee, the same probation officer making roughly $33,000 a year is assigned to that case to make sure that those those conditions of probation including payment of fine are enforced appropriately and so uh, an officer can handle between two to 250 cases uh, per officer and so if you look in the in the handout <coughs> further and you did a great job on this by the way there is uh, there's just an example of some courts and what their caseloads uh, look like so there's a there's some smaller courts like for example Ackworth 118 active cases are in Ackworth right now for basic probation, and 62 are pay only. Sandy Springs, 500 active cases, of those 103 are currently being supervised and paying no fee. And then even places like Lithonia, where you have only nine regular active cases, 20 pay only, and four right now uh, have no fee. So it's this accumulating um, issue. And I think when the, when the pay only was created, I think it's good policy. Um, I think our membership would agree it's good policy. Um, but the number three was sort of arbitrarily pulled out without data. Well, now we have data. We have four and a half years of data that suggests that, you know, it just needs to be, the policy's good, it just needs to be tweaked so that uh, city, 
county providers, in-house programs, and private providers can continue to afford to, to provide the service the state law is asking us to provide. Mr. Chairman, I'm just trying to get an answer to that one question, which okay. is the average amount. And so if I can just clarify, because that's what I'm looking for. Right. You're not reporting to me an average expenditure per person for your company. But like if I put in my calculator 33000 divided by 250, the number of cases divided by 12 for the number of months, I get 11. Does that sound reasonable as an estimate for a well, monthly you, outlay well, you, by your company? $11? Well, I mean, you got to throw in, I mean, you got to amortize the light bill, the cost of furniture, depreciation. I mean, you, I mean I, you're an attorney, I'm assuming you, maybe you're in private practice, you understand about running a business. I mean, there's the cost of professional liability in this, in the industry is, is dramatic. I mean, workers' comp is tremendous. I mean, it's so there's, okay. um, yeah. That's fine. Thank Don't you, Mr. Chair. All right, Representative Setzler. Mr. Chairman, I wanted to, to direct uh, some, some numbers to represent McLaurin's question. You know, you, you we're talking about $35 per paying case. Uh, we can look at stats that show the, the fairly large percentage, substantially large percentage of folks that don't pay. You know, to your question for a $33,000 per year uh, probation officer, you know, you're, the cost of individual benefits, the, the, the individual fringe is about 38 to 40 percent. Then you layer on commercial general liability, then, then you layer on all the cost of, of overheads. Um, and I'm speaking because in, in my, my, my day job, we do work for, for everything from local governments to, to the federal government. You know, you've got auditable overheads for all these things, and these are all expressed. It's not unconventional for a professional services organization like an accounting firm or another firm to have a break-even overhead of between 2.5 and 2.6x of the W-2 hourly rate for an employee. No, I'm, I think his operation is going to be lower lower than that. There's some that can be as low as about a 2.1x. But as you, I mean, I was running the numbers in my calculators. We're talking, we're not talking about a high profit margin here. We're talking about, you know, with, with, the, with the non-paying customers here, we're talking about whittling down to having less than 10 cents on the dollars of for-profit entity at the end of the, at, at the end, you know, pre-tax income at the end of the day here. I say this not because I'm enamored with their, with their industry or not. I'm not saying this to, 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 to carry any water for anybody or not, simply that as I ran the numbers myself, um, I was surprised by the leanness of this to be able to keep an operation going as a company given these kinds of numbers. Um, and I think I'm glad, glad to share, kind of geek out on stats with folks if it's, if it's helpful to, 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 the, to the underlying question. It's just my contention, I think others coming out of subcommittee, that to cut someone off at three months when they could be when they have an obligation not just for unpaying customers but for paying customers that extends beyond that it just doesn't seem to be um, the I, I'm, I'm surprised this this is one one could be surprised that there's any cutoff um, but I think that the, the fact that the average is five and a half and we'd be cutting off at, at three months of payment I'm not sure that anybody in this committee would be willing to sign that contract in our businesses All right, we've uh, we've kind of gotten into the discussion uh, phase at this point. I don't believe I don't see any other questions, so I thank the sponsor, and um, you can just kind of step back. All right, at this point in time, um, I'll hear if there's a motion. Motion to pass. All right, there's a motion to pass by Representative Gravel. Is there a second? All right, there's a motion and a second. Any amendments? Seeing none. Any discussion from members of the committee? Representative McLaurin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as I suggested during subcommittee, we just don't have the numbers. I mean, uh, Representative Setzler, I, I will never tire of the impressiveness with which you describe a subject that you do have expertise on. I, I mean, I, I, I'm compelled by your experience with business and also, you know, your experience on this committee, but th they're just not telling us the numbers. And, you know, 80%, I think, is the number of providers in Georgia uh, that are private. And uh, th these companies, any time, I mean, as, as we know from private prisons, which again, just as an analogy, not talking about that industry specifically, but it, it is not competition in the traditional sense. It's not competition against a marketplace where you have free entry and exit, there's no market power, and, and competition brings prices to a point where they actually match costs. That's what we assume about markets when firms compete against each other. These firms don't compete against other firms, they compete against the government for their own survival. That is the way that this market mechanism works, because it's not a market. And so given that, competition works in a fundamentally different way. And the way they compete is that former Representative Cox shows up to this hearing. That, what that means is we have no idea what the numbers are because we cannot rely on an invisible hand to tell us that the costs are matching the benefits. So if they have massive profits, that's the point I want to make. We have no way of knowing that. We can tell a story about it, but we have no way of knowing. 
Representative Setzler. M- Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not, I'm not going to amp the temperature up. I, I would say this. Um, The, the fact that we've not asked the department to come in and lay out the audible overheads of these companies, we, we could have had a very long debate, or I'm sorry, we could have had a very detailed outlay of what audible overheads and all these costs are for private probation companies, compared those with those of our state employees. I think the fact that these are, these entities are chosen by the department to be used is because when you look at the cost of, of state employees, long-term benefits, retire, the, the, the total lifetime cost of, of having this entire service performed by the state of Georgia, I believe it's been the contention over time. There's less risk to the state. There's less long-term burden to our, 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 our uh, retirement systems to the state. And it is actually a good business decision that the risk of uncompensated services being rendered by the private sector is to the advantage of the state not to create some kind of windfall profits. No, I've not, you know, the, the gentleman uh, hasn't, to my knowledge, brought that information by inquiring of the department. These are, these are all uh, obtainable pieces of information. The question, though, is this is not something we just cooked up on the fly. This has been a service that's been in place for years. And the idea that we would truncate at three months the payment of services to a contract that the state has seen fit for years to um, to, to, to use as a benefit for the taxpayers and to transfer risk to the private sector, the fact that we would truncate payments at three months is is unprecedented. I don't know where else we do this. And I think the, 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 the notion that, for example, in the, in the practice of law, if, if, if someone take, takes a legal case um, that, that's compensated by, for, for example, if you take a case as, as a public defender, I know that the rates are set for what that can be. If attorneys take those cases, but the case goes to trial and goes beyond just an early plea, you're, you're not compensated by just the, the compensation structure for if you cop a plea. If you if you take something to trial all the way through, as, an, as, a, as someone you know, you know representing an, an indigent defendant. Um, there's no truncation of hours with a third of the size of the case. You're, you're paid for the services rendered. Why we would treat this differently, I don't know, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I think, it, I, think, I think to suggest we would do that is, is and I think the implication, uh, and I'll close with this, that um, there's windfall profits, but there's been no evidence suggested of that. Um, I, don't, I don't know that it's a credible claim, Mr. Chairman. All right, Representative Trammell. Mr. Chairman, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but I just, on behalf of public defenders and uh, people who do conflict defense, that's just not accurate about caps on cases that go to trial. Um, and, I, and I only make that point because it will be germane when the budget is on the floor, and I cannot let that comment stand. All right, so I don't see any lights flashing so discussion uh, is concluded at this point so the question before us is on the passage of how or the due pass recommendation of house bill 1040 there's a motion and a second all those in favor signify by saying aye aye any opposed no all right we'll do a yeah we'll do a show of hands so all those in favor signify by raising your hands Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. nine all right all opposed Nine to five, it passes on to rules. So if you would uh, complete the rules application form, um, Representative Donahue, in my office and submit that. All right, we have a special guest with us today. I, two special guests with us today. Uh, three special guests with us today. <laughs> so as they come in the door, so we have uh, several members of the Cops Peer Court with us here today. So, Judge, um, t- you know what? I'm going to let. Uh, our uh, distinguished vice chairman from Cobb County introduce our outstanding guests who are here with you today and honored to have all of them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually appreciate the gesture. Um, three of the best judges in the state are all here right now. Judge Ruben Green, Judge Steve, Judge Steve Schuster, and Judge Tank Kell, all at Cobb Superior, and do a great job. And uh, thank you for everything that you do, and glad that you all can be here today. We had uh, Judge Chan Caudell with us as well uh, yesterday, I believe, in committee as we moved rooms three times. So, uh, so he's, yes, yeah, that was, I'm sure, a memorable experience from a day at the Capitol. But, um, 
but honored to have all of our friends on Superior Court bench with us in committee. So, this, um, no. question about. Uh, before those yes, three great judges, so I want to make sure that I recognize all the great work they do, Judge Kelly, Judge Ruber Green, and Judge Schuster. Thank you all for being here. Honored practice before you. I saw the um, news of the retirement of Judge Schuster. Judge, uh, we thank you for your service and uh, outstanding hard work to the people of the state of Georgia throughout your career. So thank you very much. Yes, sir. Chairman Fleming. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. I don't practice in front of those three <laughs> but I'm worried one day I might. <laughs> and, and so I want to say how much I believe I probably, I probably agree with the, the minority whip. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, now at this point in time, we'll proceed with the substitute to House Bill 720. If I could just give a little preamble here to the Bill, the substitute that's before you. This was heard in the Setzler subcommittee on Tuesday this week and included, um, this substitute includes almost all of the changes that were passed as amendments. There were two issues that were noticed in the final draft and the first one, I'll, I'll just point them out to you. The first one is on line 82 and this is your chairman's failure for uh, failing to communicate this to legislative council. So this is on me, I apologize, but it's striking or second which was an amendment that was passed, which I caught after the fact, and that was already voted on. The, um, the next amendment is on page nine at the bottom, line 308, striking a qualified offense and inserting life as provided for in code section 17-10-6.2, which was the amendment that we had been, um, we had agreed to we were striking some language from a previous edit of that statute actually D and because we are removing new language D has now come out of the bill it doesn't need to be amended so that's the reason you don't see it here all right I just want to make sure that explanation was given so representative Sains we will recognize you at uh, this time to present your present the substitute Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate uh, all members of this committee who have uh, worked extensively with, with me and with the uh, interested parties in making sure this is a sound bill that restores some uh, level of the, um, the compliance tools our state has utilized in ensuring that um, some of our most vulnerable potential victims do not become victims in, in, in terms of sexual offenses. This bill addresses the need for electronic monitoring of um, fel felony level um, recidivist sexual offenders um, through the use uh, uh, through the Park v. State decision we lost um, some ability to to utilize electronic monitoring through our local sheriff's offices. Um, this bill, what this bill does is ensure that we retain that tool in a very sound way by allowing a um, when that recidivist uh, when there is a uh, two occurrences of a um, of a felony level um, uh, conviction that there um, that offender gets uh, has a life probation sentence placed um, we have I think uh, one of the the uh, strongest uh, additions to this bill that came through the the sound work of, of defense association the uh, review board uh, board and pardons and parole and dcs is um, the automatic review of these individuals after 10 years on probation to see to to ensure that the state is reviewing the need for this um, this uh, this allows judicial discretion at a time where the that judge has uh, data based information because we know that a sexual offender is most likely to reoffend within a period of um, of, uh, of around five years. So this allows for us to have the uh, applicable information to ensure that we're not um, taking a tool that allows for the safety of Georgians away prematurely, um, but also not putting an individual, not continuing in a, uh, this life probation on individuals that um, aren't, um, aren't seen to be a, a risk for a risk for reoffense and in, in through the infrastructure that this state has in place. Um, there's several uh, different uh, Additional items that this bill addresses, um, the, the sexual, uh, the, the review council that levels the, the potential of, a, of an offender to uh, recidivize. Um, there's, uh, I think the subcommittee got some great information about the need for them to have the applicable information to make a, um, 
a, f a fair determination on the, that risk, and this bill allows them to get, um, m make that additional information. There was an issue heard in committee, of course, with protecting some of the ability for the Board of Pardons and Parole to conduct their investigation while allowing the Review Council to have the information they need. Um, they worked with each other throughout the day, and you see an, am an amendment, uh, a modification on, I apologize, I'm referencing by, uh, so my apologies, referencing uh, LC 480205S. Um, give me one second. I, want, I think this is an important uh, section to bring to the attention. Uh, it is on lines 191 through 197. That modification was made, and it, it is a, um, uh, has been okayed with. Uh, uh, the board and the uh, the rev the board of pardons and parole and the review board um, in in meeting both of their requirements. Um, with that, I think there's a lot the bill addresses and uh, in terms of uh, 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 the sexual review kits um, that I'll let the chairman made the amendment to add it on. If there's any, there didn't seem to be any issues with that in committee, so I'll let it stand unless there's questions for that. Uh, thank you, Representative Sains. I've chairing the meeting for just a minute here and uh, it looks like chairman Setzler would like to speak on this mr chairman just from a subcommittee perspective um it did move forward with the new pass recommendation um you know we find ourselves here on legislative day 25 with this bill for a reason because there's been considerable work done on it uh, from where it started to where it ended and uh in essence the amendments that are reflected here that were put on in subcommittee um that would differ than what uh, the, the last version that was offered in subcommittee was that um, there was some offenses that if they were the uh, second offense, sex offenses, but the underlying offense would be a, not a felony. That, that in, in some cases, they were misdemeanors of a high, of a high and aggravated nature, uh, and there were one or two select felonies that are l less likely to be actually brought is one of these underlying offenses those were removed by amendment um i think there's a desire to to advance this concept for a second offense of serious sexual offenses to be able to again get this life probation but there was some some tweaking of that in subcommittee to kind of ma maintain the spirit of the bill and maintain proportionality and there was also a change uh mr chairman that that those who who've been following this bill would perhaps appreciate with respect to the Halloween provisions that in, in fact it would be law enforcement should they choose to put one of these notification signs uh, at the residence of an offender it would be law enforcement's duty to place that. There was some discussion about a First Amendment compelled speech interest and some of the other versions of that was taken out by subcommittee. Thank you Chairman Setzler. Is there any, um, any other discussion by the committee members? Okay. Mr. Sainz, is there anything else that you would like to add? I, I think the uh, discussion uh, apparently was, uh, was uh, winded through in the five-hour five subcommittee meeting we had two days ago. I don't think anyone wants to miss their lunch here. To, to um, But I, I, th I just want to restate that I, this, what this bill accomplishes is, in, is ensuring that there's some there's sound tools for our law enforcement agencies to, to ensure that the that we don't have unnecessary victims in this state because of the ability to to um, ensure compliance of sexual offenders, um, uh, uh, as Chairman Setzler said, um, there's there's b uh, the the modifications made to this bill um, add to that objective of of balancing the primary intention of this bill, which is ensuring all individuals of this state can can feel that, that our agencies aren't aren't un unduly or unnecessarily. Uh, restricted in in measures that protect uh, their communities, um, with balancing um, uh, any lack uh, any punitive action that has no um, data based uh, rationality to it. Um, so I, I think that this is I, I appreciate the work again of this committee and and uh, appreciate the consideration. Okay, I'm no longer in control. <coughs> I think we're done discussing. All right, very good. So at this point in time, we will take a motion. 
I'll hear a motion on this bill if there is one. I will move to pass. All right, there's a motion to pass on House Bill 720, LC 480205S. We um, previously heard uh, the I uh, previously outlined the amendments, but at this point in time, we'll just make a chairman's amendment on line 82, remove or second, and on line 308, remove a qualified offense and replace it with life as provided for in code section 17 10 6.2. Is there any objection to the chairman's amendment? All right, hearing none, the bill is amended. Sorry, I'm sorry, I was trying to be sure we were added to the notification. Yes. You, Yes, so that is on lines. Are you in the, is, is that the handwritten item? What line are you referring to? Yes, yeah, it's in there. Yeah. Yeah, and that was an amendment in. Okay. Clarification for everybody. So that amendment was made and passed in subcommittee. And that is reflected. All right. Well, I read it this morning and saw it. Let me look again. Are you working on LC 480205? Yes, line, oh. line 229. Board of Pardons and Parole? We, we, had, we had 0205 in the folders. Yeah, there was a handout. There was a handout of yeah, the sub was handed out. Oh, I'm working on 0 I have two versions. All right. Time out. All right. So the only amendment that we had in subcommittee to add the Board of Pardons and Paroles is reflected, and just, just please listen to me, everyone, uh, is reflected in line 229. That was the only amendment that I had. There was not another amendment that would, that would have added the Board of Pardons and Paroles to line 214. If you desire to do so, now is the appropriate time to seek to do so. We're all, we all have the same copy right now. It's uh, yeah. put in on two fourteen. Are you, are you, is this but, for a motion, or is it for an amendment? Uh, just, just a question, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to confirm the, the chair. Of course, is right on this. That it was added on two twenty nine, not on two fourteen. I have no interest in offering an amendment personally, Mr. Chairman. I, I wasn't sure if there was a question as to the technical effect should an amendment be offered. I, I don't know what adding that to 214 would, would do. All right, Ms. Rocker, you want to uh, do you have an, uh, an opinion as to whether or not it should be added? We can work with SORB to get notifications and we don't need to hold up the process. Okay. I'll, I'll defer to the All right, is there any. All right, so another <laughs> chairman's amendment after Department of Corrections add the Board of Pardons and Paroles, comma, or. Any? Um, Move. Or I'm sorry, not, not the or, Mr. Lanier. And some license for Mr. Lanier to clean, clean that up. But the Board of Pardons and Paroles, comma. Any objection? All right, so that's added then to line 214. And then finally, uh, the, there was some compromise language that was negotiated between SORB and which has probably already been covered when I was out of the room. And so just for a uh, clarity process here, any objection to that amendment? All right, hearing none, that's adopted as well. Any other amendments? Chairman Cooper, if uh, we can vote real quick with that, are you, <laughs> if that's all right? All right, all those in favor of House Bill 720, the uh, committee substitute as amended, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. All right, we'll see hands. All those in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. six. All opposed? Two, three. Six to three. It passes on to rules. If you would please complete a uh, rules form. So, all right, thank you very much. We are possibly going to have another meeting. To, I know y'all uh, probably are not happy with me at this point, but possibly Tuesday morning at, I'm sorry, Monday morning at 8 a.m. Monday morning at 8 a.m., we'll possibly have another full committee meeting. Uh, there is no committee meeting this afternoon that is showing up on there's no non-civil committee meeting later today so I, that was an error but um hope, hope everyone has a nice weekend we're adjourned thank you